This has never been seen um, outside of this room. And this is, uh, this is from One Bowerman Drive. Hi, I'm Expo. And I'm Art. And this is Beyond the Box with Sneaker News. Our story begins in Philadelphia. Uh, I was publishing a graffiti magazine at Focus on Graffiti on Hip Hop, and it was called On The Go. Uh, I met Ari. Ari was a talented designer with a lot of computer skills. And we partnered up and we started publishing what became a magazine. And our interests were really things that were happening in the street. We were, you know, like anybody else, we got the Wu-Tang demo tape and we were really excited about it. And I really think like <laughs> Wu-Tang's whole trajectory kind of like defined us as a magazine. Like we followed them avidly, we covered them, we interviewed most of them. Um, our fortunes were tied with theirs and we did our best to represent them to the fullest. But not only Wu-Tang, like we're very interested in a lot of things that were happening, graffiti, hip hop, all across the spectrum of our own. And we were just really just trying to fill our days as 20 year olds, I think, yeah. 25 year olds. We were just looking to be busy and be creative. And I, I was really interested and passionate about graffiti, but I was also interested in growing up and figuring it a way to make graffiti make sense as a 30 year old maybe or a 35 year old. So publishing a magazine, writing about graffiti and writing about hip hop was a way to do it. So sneakers, I think, were a natural part of that. But it was interesting to know that I spent a lot of time as I was publishing my own magazine and not making a lot of money at it. I dressed like a bum, I think, for most of the 90s. And it wasn't until like, oh, around 2000 that I started having a little bit of extra money and looking for sneakers to buy. And there was nothing available. Like, it was interesting going and finding, like, Canvas Air Force Ones and being excited about that because they were non-existent, you know? So we spent a lot of time, before there was, like, independent sneaker stores and there was, like, you know, limited edition anything, we spent a lot of time just, like, running around and tracking down sneakers and looking for sneakers and not finding anything. The Nike thing, we got a call, very interesting, I got a call from, from California, from Darla Vaughn, and she wanted me to design a sneaker for Nike. And it was like really off the cuff, like the stakes at the time were very low. Nobody really expected anything. You couldn't really foresee what sneakers were gonna turn into. These companies were not open at that point. There was just, they had done a couple of small things, but it was like a PR thing and there wasn't money. So it had to be really strategic. And they still had that corporate philosophy in place where everything had to be based on decisions of um, how it was an athletic component or you could put a colorway on the technology, but ath uh, athletics was the main driver and they weren't thinking lifestyle at all at all. So trying to change anything material wise, even colors was really pulling teeth with any of the companies, not just Nike. But I don't even know why they called me. I, I still not really sure how I showed up on their radar. I was painting a lot of graffiti as a 30 year old. I had some great success in the art world. I had a project called Street Market with Barry McGee and, and Todd James, but it was still like and that felt walled off from the rest of the world. Right. Like it, it didn't, I remember specifically when I was telling people that I designed, I was designing a shoe from Nike, people were like, why are they asking you? Like, you know, Futura had done a bunch of shoes, Stash had done a bunch of shoes. They were known, they were known entities. I felt like I, I was not at the time, but I definitely think the shoe did a lot to make me a known entity. I got the call. Well, you know, what can I say? Like, I got the call. It was for charity. It was a simple design a shoe. We'll, we'll sell a few pairs. We'll take the, we'll make a donation to a charity of your choice. And at the time, like, I had been in trouble for graffiti. I had a court case. It got educated. 
But as part of the court case was, I was packing meals for an organization called God's Love We Deliver. So it was a natural thing for me to say, Nike, please make a donation to God's Love We Deliver. Great organization. I still highly recommend them. The initial things when Nike reached out, it was their first artist series. It was. Okay. And it was part of Pharrell, Halle Berry, and Steve. The other artists that had made Nike shoes to that point were Hayes, Stash, and Futura. These were like bona fide train riders, New York, you know, legends. They, they all had stripes for different reasons in different factions of New York. And I was an out-of-towner. I was basically, you know, Philadelphian in New York. So for me to get the call, it was kind of an odd choice, but I think I did the best I could with it. Well, that's a nice custom case you got there. Yeah, nice custom case we got here. Wow. So, you guys selling these? Can I get a couple? I need, I need one. The back and forth with Nike was, I wanted to make a completely clear, see-through plastic shoe. The entire thing? Completely. Completely. Everything. Like, you could see through every aspect of it. Nike pushed back and said, no, we can't do that structurally and otherwise. It, it won't work. And I wanted an Air Force One. Yes. And I got pushed to the, I, you know, and it was interesting because I wanted the one, but they said, no, you can't have the one. The one is walled off for, you know, one reason or another. Like, you can't touch the one. So. And then the dunk. You, I couldn't do a dunk either. Yeah. But they had released an Air Force Two in red, white, and blue colors for the Philadelphia 76ers. And I said, well, then I'm going to go with the two because that's now the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia shoe. It was a classic that way. I wanted a clear shoe to show the artwork. I wanted to put elements of my artwork throughout the shoe. Hayes made a really beautiful Air Force One. Dunk. Dunk. Hayes made a really, they, Hayes, Fuch, Stash made really, really great looking shoes. So I decided the next move was to make something ridiculous. <laughs> the next thing was to make an actual art shoe and to make something that was really crazy. And when I presented it to Nike, they said, no, we make performance shoes. We're worried that this won't be, this won't perform. And I said, it's gonna perform as art and that's what's important is that it doesn't, it doesn't need to win at the track meet or the basketball court. It needs to function as a, as a piece, as an art piece. It was exhausting. It was exhausting to the point that I should have held my breath and forced them to make an all plastic see-through shoe because obviously they did right, right after that. And then they made the, the Invisible Woman. So in any case... And then the clot, I think, had the clear toe. And then the other 15 right. plastic shoes that they made. That, I, lo I love that clot shoe, that was great. But whatever, like, I'm really proud that they, they took a chance and they made, they made happen what they made happen. I'm very grateful that they made this shoe. The shoe has elements of artwork on it that all relate to buying and wanting and craving. The, the expenditure, you know, the, the complete expenditure on something that it's not even functional, you know? It's, it's functional as an item of want, you know, as, as something to cherish and to make others feel bad and jealous that you have and they don't. So <laughs> that ties into the two elements that are actually in the toe box. One says fiend and it's a wide open eye, like excited. And one says filled, which is the, the eye that's sedated. Yeah. The eye that's like had its fill and it's like, you know, it's full of pizza. And then inside is the crushed public city trash can. Oh uh, yeah, the trash can, because it's street. And my self portrait, the pigeon. Probably the first time a pigeon appeared on a Nike shoe. Yes, 100%. First time an that's artist. That's not a slight, it's just, just saying. Just facts. You know, after the back and forth. A part it, of the back and forth, not, sorry not to cut you off, was that they couldn't, they couldn't see structurally how this would work, how it would hold. They were making samples and they were ripping out. So they weren't getting a thick enough grade vinyl, clear vinyl, for it to really work. So they kept sending us versions of this that was 
in layers. So there was the clear layer, then there was like a cheesecloth mesh kind of thing underneath it, and then another layer for the backing. So it looked like, kind of like that off-white style, you know, that you see now where it's sort of the deconstruction of the shoe. You're seeing the elements. It literally looked like that. And it was kind of incredible, but they, we tried to save it, but they made us send it back. But we could see, like, we were inspiring them and they were sending back stuff to us further along, pushing it further. And they were pushing it in directions that we weren't interested in. But we could tell that the excitement level yeah. in the design, on the design team was lit. And they were, they were excited and they were sparked. Once they turned the corner and they accepted the change and they accepted where the company was gonna be forced to go, then they got excited about it. Then you started to see like the innovative Nike fire like get lit and they were really excited. It was a it it was a better part of a year of it going back and forth, yeah. you know? Um but it was when it was all done and said, um they sent it to us in a box, sealed, and it was one of those things where I didn't want to open the box. I thought it was really precious that it, I, not to open a box. And then when I finally did, I realized that they, it, they were wrapped in plastic like in the box, which meant that they were aging even more than they would have if they were just left alone in the box. One of the things about this that I think is really a, a real hallmark to the art of it is, you know, they're made out of plastic. It's a petroleum product. It's gonna age. You know, from the minute it was created, it started dying. It's, you know, it's dying right before our eyes. <laughs> it is a perfect representation of, of life. It, it, it is brief. It is, it is meant to be embraced in its time. And used. And used and appreciated, and it's going away. It is fading, at, at, you know, like the sun. The box was designed and printed on campus. Um, one of one, as far as we know. As far as we know. I think they made a few for, for the people, people in the room. Um, definitely looks, looks screen printed. Yeah. Design is screen printed. Inspired. Looks, looks Espo inspired, but they did their own twist on it. As an artist, like, you know, getting the chance to do, to take, take the machine for a ride, you know. Nike gave me the keys to the car, and they let us do something really, really fun and interesting here. Um, also, I should point out on the socks, there's, this is it, baby. This is the whole, this is life itself. It's two boxing gloves. One says wants and one says needs, and they're, they're squaring off. This has never been seen um, outside of this room. And this is a, uh, in the back and forth process, the creative process that we went through with Nike, they sent us a few things to, Get the ball rolling. This is from One Bowerman Drive in Beaverton, Oregon. This is like a later version. There's actually another version, but. And this is with like that typical Nike 3M, which was always that kind of silvery gray color, of which we were like, no, the blue. So this is version two. This one we have the, the plastics worked out, uh, the art, is in place and now we're just tweaking color um it's crazy how the plastic is really going on these um it looks like it was sitting in the sun melting yeah it looks like it's, it's it was on the dashboard of a 69 camaro <laughs> that's been in the impound lot since 2003 but um and whatever it looks beautiful the colors it, you know again Steve was saying about the Air Force Two being that sort of iconic uh, Philly shoe of the, I guess the ABA, yeah. um, Dr. J kind of era, and that red, white, and blue. So this didn't have any of that. So the artwork here is like a dark forest green. This is gray. Um, it's the Eagles. Is... It's the Eagles colors. What's interesting about this is like this is this is the materials they had, you know, in the lab in China you know, wherever they did their, their sampling at. Does that, say does that have the sample tag? No, it does say uh, property of Nike, not for resale. <laughs> Sorry, it's Indonesia. So, you know, they went to, they went to their spot in Indonesia and they, they had them. I don't know 
where they got the plastic from, but it's a, it's, it feels like it's slightly different plastic the than final. what they ended up on the final. And when people would wear the, the actual final shoe, some dudes just have swamp foot and sweat a lot, and the whole shoe would fog up. Yeah, which I should, I should say leads me to the, the story that I have for the one time that I wore these. Basically, I have a studio in, in Tribeca, and at the time I had an apartment in Soho. So it's like a 10 block walk. So I put on these shoes, as you do, and I walked from my studio to my apartment, and I don't know, I got three blocks. I got a block and a half and my feet started hurting. The plastic started cutting into my toe. And then by the time I got to out of Tribeca and I was crossing Canal Street into Soho, my feet were bleeding, bleeding. And I could see through the clear toe box, I could see my blue sock and I could see the blood soaking the sock. <laughs> it was funny, we were like, what the fuck? And I was like, wow, this is a real art project. I've really made art here. I feel like a real artist now. The thing is, is that as far as it goes with Nike, like I would love to do something. It's just hard to get the freedom again. You know, it's like, you know, it, respect to Kanye and respect to, like I said, Virgil and respect to like the creators that get freedom, get money, get clearance to take off. Like this represented complete, beautiful freedom. Even in collaboration, there was a lot of freedom and there was a lot of respect for the vision. That's, you know, that's all I want. Like the door is open, but the conversations we have, it's like, you know, it just, it won't approach. There's no point in doing anything unless this is the starting point. You know what I mean? This can't be the ceiling. This has to be the floor. So the conversations tend to be like, how can we do something else that's similar to what we've done already? And I can't see it. Like I can only see like going up from here. So uh, the doors open, the phone lines are open. Operators are standing by. We're excited. We're thrilled that if the possibility exists, but what we want is everything.